polynomials. They are everywhere in computer graphics. Whether you're doing modeling, animation, or rendering, you probably keep running into them or you're about to. Hi, my name is Jamie Uxell, and in this talk, I will tell you that you should not be scared of polynomials. Even though I'll talk about the more scary kind, cubic and higher order polynomials, I will tell you that there's an efficient way to compute their roots. But before we get into that, let's talk about why we care about polynomials. Well, polynomials have way too many use cases in computer graphics for me to list them all, but let me give you a few examples. We use them to draw curves and, and model hair and any smooth continuous shape, really. And even when we're working with triangles, continuous collision detection requires solving a cubic polynomial. When we're rendering these curves, again, we need to solve polynomial equations. So polynomials are everywhere, and we all know what they are. A polynomial has this form, where d is the degree of the polynomial in this case, and oftentimes we are interested in the roots of the polynomial, such that using these values for x would make the polynomial equal to zero. All right, let's start talking about the simplest kind, quadratic polynomials that are of degree two. Quadratic polynomials that are very well known, have very well known solution, the quadratic formula, and we can just plug that in and we get our roots. Very, very easy. Actually, this is not great numerically because it may involve taking the difference between two relatively large numbers, and that's not great numerically. So a better way to do that would be making sure that these two terms have the same sign. So this way, we're not taking the difference between two large numbers and have a lot of numerical truncation. But this gives us one of the roots. We can compute the other root using a similar formula. You can actually very easily derive this from the other one. And using these two, we can get our roots. Very, very good. And what are we doing here, really? It's just We're just computing a square root and two divisions. Those are the expensive computations, and they're both supported by hardware. They're super, super cheap. So quadratics are very, very, very cheap. And, well, nothing will really compute with them. So quadratics are great. Moving on. Moving on to cubics of degree three. Now, with cubics, again, we have a formula. We also have an analytical formula. Again, that involves computing, let's say, something like delta. And that delta is some value that we can compute from this ABCD coefficients. I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's not important. Regardless, you compute that and you see if it is positive, then I can have, I'm going to have one root and I can compute that root using a cubic root operation, not square root, cubic root. If it is negative, then I'm going to have to do some, some trigonometric operations like r cosine followed by a bunch of cosines to get the three roots. Now, as you can see, this is not going to be as cheap as quadratic because these are not necessarily supported by hardware. There may be some hardware supporting trigonometric operations, but not so much for cubic root. That's one thing that this is going to be quite a bit more expensive, but also, also, there's going to be lots of numerical error involved in these computations. And that's going to reflect in the final roots that we compute using this analytical formula. So we're going to have a lot of error as a result of that. We can do better, actually, if we can compute these roots numerically. So give me a cubic polynomial. I can actually compute its roots within a, the region that I'm interested in, within the interval that I'm interested in fairly easily, hoping that maybe there is a root here. And I can do that, let's say, using the simplest technique, bisection. And bisection works like this. I, of course, I can compute the values of the polynomial at the endpoints. And by looking at their signs, I can tell that, oh, there must be a root in between. All good. So if there's a root in between with bisection, I'm going to compute the polynomial at the midpoint. And by looking at the sign, I can say, OK, this part, this part of the interval contains the root, so I can get rid of the other part. And I can keep doing this, split the interval down the middle and compute the polynomial and figure out where the root is. And I keep doing that until my interval is small enough, smaller than an epsilon. And I say, OK, I am close enough to my root. I'm just going to return the midpoint of this interval, and I'll be happy. All right. So that's how bisection works. It works. But it's not so great, because with every, every step in bisection, we're getting one bit closer to our result. One bit. Yeah, I, I mean a, a literal bit closer to our result. So it's, it's not great. Its convergence rate is not great. And we can do better using a very popular technique called Newton iterations. So here's how it works. Let's say that we're starting on one end of this interval. It's not always a great idea, but let's go with it. I'm going to compute the value of that polynomial at that point, 
And then with Newton iterations, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that my function is linear. So I'm going to linearize my function, that is I compute a derivative and assume that it's linear like this. And if it is linear, I can very easily find its root. And that's going to be my next guess for where the root is. And at that point, I'm going to compute the polynomial again, and I'm going to compute its derivative. And with that, I'm going to find my next guess. And with that, I'm going to compute the derivative again, and I'll find my next guess. And as you can see, with just a few steps, Newton iterations bring me very, very close to the actual root. And when the Newton step size is small enough, I say, okay, I'm close enough, I probably found my root. So that's pretty much how it works. But they're not always stable, actually. If my function is slightly different, let's shift it to this side a little bit and start from the same position again. In this case, when I compute the polynomial value and its derivative, ooh, it's not gonna give me a helpful next guess, right? So that's gonna be bad. Actually, it can't even tell me if there is a root in this region, right? So it's not all that helpful all the time. But we can improve this fairly easily. So given a polynomial like this, I can take this polynomial, instead of blindly applying Newton iterations, I'm going to first split it into three pieces using these critical points of the polynomial where its derivative is zero. And as you can see, in between these pieces, the polynomial is monotonic. So it's either increasing or decreasing, but there's no hump. And that will save us. And this derivative of the polynomial is actually very, very easy to compute, right? Given a polynomial, cubic polynomial, I can get its quadratic derivative. So it's a very simple technique. Give me a polynomial, and I'm interested in the roots within some region, right? I can compute the values at the ends, of course. But more importantly, I'm going to compute its critical points using its derivative. And I'm going to use that to split my polynomial into three pieces within this interval that I'm interested in. And then if there are any roots in that interval, I can find them using Newton iterations. Of course, I'm going to have to do separate sets of Newton iterations for each one of these sections. And it's great. And it's very easy to make sure that Newton iterations are stable within these regions. So I can find up to three roots that I may have with this cubic using three separate sets of Newton iterations. Well, actually, I can do better using deflation. So give me a cubic if I know one of its roots, let's call it xr, I can deflate this cubic by writing it as a product of x minus xr and a quadratic polynomial. And this quadratic, the coefficients of this quadratic are very easily compute. So now I have a quadratic left, and if I know the roots of this quadratic, I can find the remaining roots. So basically, I just need to solve one of the roots using Newton iterations, and then I can deflate my polynomial and find the other two roots if I need to. So this ends up being a fairly efficient algorithm. If you look at the computation times, of course, quadratics are really, really fast. I'm saying less than 10 nanoseconds. It can be significantly less than 10 nanoseconds, actually. It's depending on your implementation. So they're very fast. Cubics are going to be quite more expensive, but not by much, right? They're still very affordable. Right? Actually, this number is a little difficult to tell because it really depends on what kind of polynomial you're dealing with, right? If there's no root, for example, this is going to be really fast to identify that there's no root. You just need to solve a quadratic to figure out where the critical points are, and then you'll know if there's a root or not very, very easily. So it doesn't involve much computation. If there is a root, then you're going to have to do numerical root finding, so it's going to be a little more expensive. And if there are more than one root, then we're going to have to do this deflation and find the other roots, and that's going to be fairly cheap as well. So as you can see, it's, it's definitely more expensive than a quadratic, but, but still pretty good. And it is actually more efficient than the analytical formula. In fact, it's not just more efficient than the analytical formula, but I can also use a smaller error threshold and get a much closer result than the analytical formula as well. So this gives me a fairly efficient and stable way of computing cubics. Let's move on to higher order polynomials that are degree four or higher. So let's say with a degree four polynomial, as a quartic, it's going to look like this. And for that, I'm going to 
compute the roots of its derivative, which is going to be a degree three polynomial, and I know how to solve those. And with that, I can find its critical points and split the polynomial into four pieces in this case. Within each one of these pieces, I'm going to have a monotonic function. And if there's a root within the region that I'm interested in, I can very easily find those roots using the same idea with numerical root finding. If I have a fifth degree polynomial, in this case, I'm going to compute its derivative, which is going to be a fourth degree polynomial. I just talked about how to do that for fourth degree polynomial. And using that, I can split it into five pieces, right? So it's, that is the idea. If you look at the algorithm, it will look like something like this to compute the roots of a polynomial. First, I'm going to find the roots of its derivative. And with that, I'm going to split it into a finite number of intervals. And within each one of these intervals, I'm going to check if there's a root. And because within each interval, the function is monotonically increasing or decreasing, I can just look at the endpoints. If at the endpoints, my function value, if, they're, if it's the, the, just the signs of the endpoint values, if they are the same, if they're both positive or both negative, then I cannot have a root. So I can skip that interval. If they have different signs, then I definitely do have a root, and I can find that root using numerical root finding. So this results in a recursive algorithm. To be able to find the roots of a polynomial of a particular degree, I first solve the roots of a polynomial of a lower degree, all the way down to a quadratic. Right? And because of that, this algorithm has quadratic complexity. But it's important to note, it's important to note that there is no deflation here. Now, there are polynomial solvers that do use deflation, but if you use deflation with this particular algorithm, the complexity becomes exponential. So you definitely don't want to do that. All right, before we talk about computation times, I want to talk about this fine root first, this numerical root finding step in the middle here. All right. So for that, we're going to use a combination of Newton iterations and bisection. More specifically, we're going to use Newton iteration when it works, and bisection when Newton iteration fails. Here's what I mean by this. Let's say that I have a function like this and I'm trying to find its root within a, a monotonic region like this. And let's say that I'm starting from that very end point. And with Newton iteration, I'm going to compute the next Newton guess and it's going to give me that point. It's very good, right? It's, it's good. I'm going to take that. I'm going to compute the value of my polynomial there. And I see that this one is positive. The other one is negative. That means my root should be in this region. So I can just reduce my interval and get closer to my root. And I take my next Newton step and ooh, that gave me a root out of that interval, which is not great. This is not going to be helpful. Right, so I'm going to treat this as a failed Newton step, and I'm going to ignore that particular guess. And instead, I'm going to use bisection by splitting my interval down the middle and computing my function over there and reducing my interval this way. So by using combinations of Newton iterations and bisection when Newton iteration does not give me a helpful next guess, I'm going to make sure that my interval gets smaller and smaller at every step. So this guarantees that I definitely converge to the final root in the end. All right, now we're ready to talk about the computation times. Now we've seen the computation times for degree two and degree three. For degree four, it's going to be significantly more expensive because solving a degree four polynomial involves solving a degree three polynomial first and then doing some numerical root finding. So that's going to be more expensive, of course. For degree five, same deal. It's going to be more expensive than degree four. For degree six, it's going to be more expensive than degree five and degree seven and so forth. But as you can see, the growth is not that bad considering that there's quadratic complexity here. It's actually pretty good. But I must say that we're probably pushing it too far because you see that we have 32 bits, single precision floats. That's probably not good enough for computing a seventh degree polynomial itself, let alone finding its roots. So probably that's not sufficient. So let's move on to 64 bits, double precision. I'll show you a graph of computation times up to degree 10 here. And as you can see, the growth is not linear. It's, it's quadratic, but it's not too bad. Even up to degree 10, the computation time growth is pretty manageable. Of course, the actual numbers here depend on the error tolerance you use for numerical root finding. So if you use a lower error tolerance, then your computation times will go up a little bit because you're going to have to do a few more iterations to find the roots, right? Nonetheless, 
If you compare it to a relatively popular root finder called rpoly, you'll see that its computation times are off the charts. But this should not give you the wrong impression because at some point rpoly is going to catch up and it's going to be faster because this the quadratic growth here. But these are just some numbers out of context. They don't really mean much, do they? So let's put them in context with a challenge. And the challenge we're going to use for this is hair rendering. Now I'm going to tell you why I picked this particular challenge. But before we get into that, let's define this problem. Now hair is often represented as a curve, like a polynomial curve like this. Now, of course, it's not an infinitely thin curve, but a curve with a thickness. And this thickness can be defined by using a circle and moving it along this curve, defining a surface like this. So it's like a thick curve, if you will. What we're going to do is that we're going to compute ray intersections. We're going to do ray tracing and we're going to compute ray intersections with this thick curve and find the intersection points with its surface. Now, if the underlying curve, if the underlying hair curve is defined using a cubic polynomial, this intersection problem, when you do the math, ends up being a polynomial problem of degree 10. So we're going to find the roots of a degree 10 polynomial to find these intersection points. And for that, we're going to use our brute force polynomial root finder. Now, the reason I picked this problem is that this is quite a challenge for root finder. We're dealing with degree 10 polynomials. But there's another reason. This problem actually has an excellent high performance solution in the form of phantom ray hair intersector. And I would like to find out how this polynomial root finder compares against this dedicated solution for this problem. Let's find out. So we're going to render hair, but I don't want to spend too much time shading this hair nicely and all because we're interested in the ray curve intersection component, right? So we're just going to use the primary rays and find their hair intersections and that's about it, right? So let's get rid of this, th this one. All right, this is why we're computing. Now, I did another thing here is I took this hair model and I downsampled it such that I have longer curves. By doing that, I brought down the performance of the ray tracing acceleration structure quite a bit, so everything slowed down. But I have now longer curves and the render time depends on the performance of the ray curve intersection routine. But it doesn't matter because we're interested in the relative times. All right, when we're using cubic polynomials to define the hair curves, here's what happens. We get a degree 10 polynomial to find the intersections as we talked about. And let's call this 1x render time, all right? If I use phantom ray hair intersector, my render time actually goes up to 1.7x in this case, turns out, with brute force polynomial computation, I'm 70% faster. Now, I can also use quadratic curves, a quadratic approximation of these curves, in which case I get lower degree polynomials, so they're significantly faster, and the difference between the performance is actually quite a bit more significant here. But the actual numbers, I wanna say, I don't wanna emphasize them too much because we did a few things, right? We sort of downsampled them, we got longer curves, and that brought down the performance of everything. And the phantom ray hair intersector is sort of designed to take advantage of these shorter hair curves. So the actual numbers I showed you earlier, they don't matter too much. What's important here is to see that this polynomial root finder can compete with a dedicated high performance solution for this very problem. So that tells me that this polynomial root finder is actually pretty fast. All right, now there are a few details here that I did not get into in this talk, like how do we handle infinite intervals? How do we make sure that our error bound is always satisfied and how all these numbers I showed you were generated? If you wanna find out more, please check out my talk at the High Performance Graphics Conference this year and the accompanying paper. And for more, and to get your hands on the source code, you can go to my website following this link where you will find a reasonably high performance implementation of this idea in C++ that you can use for your own projects. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this talk and thank you for watching.